Well, welcome to um, the Oxford Tract here in Berkeley, California. This is a, a little research experiment station of the University of California. What I'm going to do in this video is to give you some lessons about urban agroecology uh, based on some experiments that we've been doing here uh, with the students of my class, Urban Agriculture. And we are here in a large-scale experiment of urban agroecology. And the students have established different plots with different treatments that include combinations of different intercropping patterns between lettuce, arugula, mizuna, chard, kale, and many other crops. And so what we're studying here is the different combinations, how they behave, what is the outcome in terms of productivity of the different combinations of crops. And to some, some of these combinations, we impose other treatments such as, for example, composting or double composting or mulching or compost tea applications. And then in that way, we have a very complex set of treatments that allows us to determine which are the, the best combinations of crops and which types of organic soil management and mulching uh, te uh, techniques uh, complement or encourage even more the productivity of the systems. So for example, uh, in this particular case, we have a combination of uh, kale and bok choy and lettuce all together. And uh, the idea is to see if these crops uh, complement each other, uh, uh, they produce well together, or is better another combination. Uh, in this case here we have, for example, uh, Mizuna with uh, arugula intercropped. In other cases we have Mizuna with broccoli and, and lettuce together. And the students, what they do is they, they, they take the, the biomass of these crops in these different combinations, and then we calculate what is called the land equivalent ratio, because we also have plots with monocultures of lettuce and Mizuna and arugula and other crops and so we take the, the yields in monoculture versus the yields in polycultures and then we, then we calculate the land equivalent ratio which gives you an idea of how, the, how efficient the, the polycultures are in the use of the resources like sunlight and water and nutrients and so on. What we're finding is that the LER values, the LER values are usually higher than one which means that the polycultures over yield the monocultures. So an LER of 1.5 for example means that you need 1.5 hectares of monoculture to obtain the same productivity that you would get from one hectare of polyculture. So in other words, you need 50% more land in monoculture to obtain uh, what you would get from one unit of land of polyculture. And it, that's because when you combine crops, they start utilizing the resources like nutrients and water and uh, sunlight in a much more efficient way. Also, by combining different crops, sometimes you create conditions that are not very inviting for pests or diseases because, for example, uh, some plants that you combine can be repellent and therefore uh, insects don't like the odor and therefore don't colonize the main crop or sometimes some crops can mask uh, the other crop and therefore the insect gets lost and doesn't find it or certain crops that start flowering, they attract beneficial insects which actually use the pollen and nectar and these beneficial insects such as predators and parasitoids are attacking the pest of the associated crop. So you get all these interactions, all these complementarities that allows for these um, intercropping systems to be much more uh, sustainable and much more efficient. So for example, this field is surrounded by, by, by buckwheat, which is a flowering plant. It's a grain actually from the family Polygonaceae, which uh, uh, is used in other countries like in Japan and in Italy to make bread or to make pasta. And, but the main use that we have for this plant is that uh, because it flowers very soon, very quickly, attracts a lot of beneficial insects, natural predators and parasitoids and pollinators. And uh, because these plants, these this insects require pollen and nectar for their optimal longevity and, and, and fecundity. And then by having the, this, these plants early on, when, before you, 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 you plant your crops, uh, what you, you do is you build up an army of beneficial insects that are going to quickly move into, the, into colonizing the crops as soon as the pests arrive and then they are able to regulate them because most predators and parasitoids regulate pests at low densities of the pests. So you have to have the presence of natural enemies early on in the season so that they can do the job. If they, if they come late when the aphid population started you know, exploding, no matter how many ladybugs or syrphid flies you have here, you're not going to be able to regulate them. So it is very crucial that you create the habitat for beneficial insects early in the season and then with flowers that are going to last you know, for two months or three months so you, you can plant a sequential planting of uh, buckwheat, for example. And that way you have 
ensure the presence of flowers for attracting these beneficial insects. Some of the students have um, imposed some treatments over the intercropping systems, for example, mulching. Mulching is very important because uh, if you use straw and you have at least a 10 centimeter uh, thick um, mulch, you can reduce weed pressure, obviously. The, you can affect the germination of weeds by, by suppressing the, the, the light and, and the other conditions that are necessary for seed to germinate, but also you can, serve, you can conserve a lot of moisture. Because here we're in California, in the middle of a drought, and one of the key things for us is to uh, grow crops with little water as possible. So we're using drip irrigation. At the same time, we're adding organic matter to the soil via compost, which increases the water holding capacity of the soil. And then we're putting mulch on top of that because mulch can reduce evaporation and conserve a lot of moisture and at the same time suppress weed growth. We also have taken soil samples uh, before we planted these crops and now we're going to take soil samples after the treatments with compost or with mulch to see if there was any changes, for example, in certain chemical characteristics of the soil such as pH, nitrogen levels, organic matter content and so on. And we're doing this in an urban setting because what we want to do is to try to come up with models of combinations of crops, what we call agroecological combinations, that would allow for a high productivity. Uh, our goal here is to reach 10 to 20 kilos per square meter in terms of productivity per year. Because um, what's going to happen by the year 2030 is that we're going to have the cities of uh, more than 10 million people are going to double. 75% of, uh, of the population is going to live in cities at the global level and we need to start producing food in the cities where there's a lot of abandoned land here in, in, in Oakland. We have about 400 to 500 hectares of abandoned public land that could be put into production with organic crops. When you find that a city of 10 million people imports 6,000 tons of food per day, well, that means that this, the cities are very vulnerable because uh, on the one side that food has to travel about 1,000 kilometers uh, in terms of food miles which has all kinds of implications in terms of energy use, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, and the vulnerability of the city that has to depend from that food comes in. So with urban agriculture, you can actually localize production and you can start producing uh, food that perhaps could produce about 30% of the needs of vegetables for, for, a, for a city of 10 million people if you reach levels of production that are equivalent to about 10 to 20 kilos of, uh, of, uh, of food per square meter per year. Well, I hope you found uh, this lesson interesting. Uh, we were, we're sharing the results of our experiment and we hope that uh, you can take some lessons uh, to, to learn some principles that you can apply in your own gardens because the idea is, is not so much to be fixed on the technologies or the combinations of crops, but rather the principles that we have been using the principles of diversification, the principles of enhancing organic matter in the soil, the principle of increasing biological activity in the soil, the principle of covering the soil and minimizing losses, and the principles of creating an infrastructure that is going to allow for beneficial insects and other organisms that are playing very important key roles here to thrive and thus uh, basically drive the productivity of the systems. Because these systems don't work so much with external inputs but they rather work because you assemble biodiversity that is going to be interacting and through those interactions then the processes of nutrient cycling and pest regulation and productivity uh, are their final result. So thank you very much for, your, for listening.